Welcome to Ever Beyond Beyond on Wolf Spirit Radio, everbeyondradio.com, Tierna Sow from Ireland, Scottish Sovereigns on the Land.ning.com. Be prepared to leave your belief systems behind as we go beyond teachers, beyond gurus, beyond duality. Ever beyond, 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 beyond. Good afternoon, America. Good morning, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, good evening, UK. Um, and uh, welcome to the first show in Nightmare Fortnight, where uh, where everything goes out of time. So tonight we're, we're at 10 o'clock in Britain and uh, 3 o'clock in, uh, in uh, Nevada. So... That's the uh, that's the state of play. Time is messed up. They've been messing with time again. Doctor, come in and yeah, fix it for us. So um, I, I don't want to spend too much time um, with maintenance uh, things. I've got some new jingles. Um, they're all in four three two hertz. Uh, they're all uh, well, one hundred eight hundred eight hertz as well for that low note new. Um, but. Uh, uh, they're all uh, designed to be uh, healing, non-triggering, and uh, and uh, good for the soul, especially if you've got PTSD. And uh, so today, my uh, very special guest, um, uh, if, well, so many things that I could introduce him as, but uh, I'm just going to introduce him as his name, and then we'll we'll talk about what and why and where and who and all the other five or six questions that we uh, we have to ask. Um, today, uh, my guest is Simon Parks, a, uh, a UK uh, local councillor, as a local politician, uh, and, um, and uh, originally um, a driving instructor and uh, a very kind of normal, normal sounding life. And then, uh, and then uh, 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 an announcement of, um, of uh, a very curious um, uh, heritage which we which we'll discuss as well i mean it's all part of the story it's all part of the journey um so without any more um uh, the flabby interrupt introduction good afternoon simon good evening how are you excellent 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 so um uh, where do we start well <laughs> uh you knew you've known about this all your life, obviously, because I mean you've been talking about it. But were you consciously aware of all of the t the different? Um, uh, uh, no, forget it. Start again. Where did it start for you, Simon? Aware that the world around me um, wasn't quite the world that <laughs> that everyone else saw it as. And as I grew older, um, I privately to myself tried to work out um, what was going on, why was I having these interactions and others weren't. And I also learned that I had to be quiet because general in general company to start talking about these things didn't go down very well. So it was perhaps only in the last 10 or 15 years that I've been able to put all the pieces together as best as I could and come up um, with some sort of answer. Now for your second question, um, I think it really all started for me uh, officially <laughs> in terms of my uh, trajectory of, of understanding in 1971. So I would just have been around 12 years old. Um, when I had an experience where I was taken on a craft by what we say in Britain as mantids and what the uh, Americans call a mantis. And that was a very formative experience for me because um, I had to make a choice, a choice as to who did I want to associate with, would it be reptilian-type creatures or mantid 
mantis type creatures and I chose to associate with mantis creatures and from that moment onwards um, my experiences were not solely with the mantis but very much so. So I think 1971 would be the moment that my life completely changed. So at that time when we you know people who are interested in aliens and the things of this world it was it was always relegated to complete fantasy because they had the big lockdown on on the truth embargo but um you know when i <laughs> you know you, you're about you're just a little older than me but uh we were i had my nose um firmly glued to the front of the tv set during all and any science fiction doctor who um uh, Star Trek, uh, Joe 90, I've been revisiting. Yes. That's something else. Now I know about MK Ultra and yes. Montauk, you know. <laughs> so, um, all of these, all of these, uh, shows, they showed aliens and they were, sometimes they were blobs. Uh, sometimes they were like, um, you know, uh, life gemmers, but not as we know it. And all of those, but, um, Actually, it was only until Babylon 5 that, that we actually started to see the insectoids in sci-fi. They, uh, they had a mantid who was like the, the, this wheeler dealer, um, you know, the, the, the black market dealer. He was down in the, in the alien department in uh, Babylon 5. But they were not portrayed so much, you know. Um, but when I think of the universe, if, if I think of the planet and I think, well... Here on this planet, there exist these little creatures, and they're like, you know, there's one that's an inch long, there's one about three inches long, and we call them different names, but they're the same creature. Like, you know, you call them a grasshopper, you call it a, a locust, um, you know, but essentially it's the same creature within a different scale. Um, and I just presume that scale exists all throughout the universe uh, as a question of, you know, there will, if there are. If there are six-inch humans, there are, you know, six-foot mantids, things like that. Is, does, does that pan out? Is, is, is that a kind of true assessment of the way things are in the galaxy? I think that um, humans, Earth humans, are quite happy to see bug-eyed monsters, and the more bug-eyed a monster is, the happier they are. The more human a creature looks, or the more it resembles something on Earth, the more uncomfortable earth humans are with that because it's too close to home too close to comfort too close to core so um i think that as t tv developed as directors of tv shows and movies uh, became more and more closer to the cia and the national security agency as they were given more and more heads up uh, on what would be a good story so we saw the type of creatures uh, developing from the 1960s and 1970s into things that are very, very human now. Um, you talked about Joe 90 and some of the other fantastic uh, British, uh, let's get that out there, <laughs> British programs. Yeah, good old British stuff. That were produced in the 60s and 70s. And um, yeah, it was actually uh, for many, many kids, both boys and girls in Britain and indeed around the world, it was staple viewing. Um, Slightly different for me because there were some programs that I was required to watch. Uh, for instance, um, things like Stingray. I don't know if some of your audience might be familiar with that, but with Stingray, uh, I had to, I had to sit and watch that. My mother would sit with me, um, and we watched that. It was about a 30 minute program, and I wasn't allowed to speak or eat or leave the room while that was on. Uh, and there were certain programs like that that I had to watch. And there was one, one series of programs called UFO, which I think was in 1969. Oh, yeah. Ed, uh, um, Ed something. Ed, uh, I can't yeah. remember. The guy with uh, the white hair. Yeah, uh, it'll come back to me. <laughs> um, and basically, I was shipped off to my grandparents, uh, who had a colour television, 1969, in Britain, not many people had colour TVs back then, but my grandfather had a colour television and I was shipped off there weekly where I had to sit and watch that, uh, also with the Avengers. So um, there were messages, you see, in these programmes where directors 
of science fiction, whether they were for children or not, didn't matter, who were being given information to help them with their story, but were being asked to put out certain themes. Think of Captain Scarlet, for instance. Um, so uh, I think what's happened is that that humanity over the last 30, 40 years has been steered uh, in some ways positively and in some ways negatively towards accepting a new sort of alien. So back in the 60s and 70s it was bug-eyed monsters. In actual fact, um, I'm trying to think of the film in the 19... 1959 or 1960, I think it was Quatermass and the Pit, where oh, yeah. I saw mantis type creatures uh, then. But you're right, they very rarely appeared until more recently. So, and and uh, as you know, and back to back to the the whole TV thing. Jerry Anderson, I mean, you, you cited many, many shows there. Jerry Anderson, um, famous for Thunderbirds, but as you said, Stingray, Joe 90, UFO, uh, Fireball XL5. Um, yeah. Oh my, you know, the, there's just so many. And they all had this, uh, what we call now, disclosure in them. Yeah. Um, just... And uh, so, so this is really interesting because you were instructed uh now uh, we've heard a lot of people have, have, have seen your other interviews so we kind of you know we know about the the, the you know you, your mother was part of the the uh, secret services and, and and military services and things like that so she was following orders obviously <laughs> yeah place him in front of the tv and don't let him you know etc um yeah. and she would follow the orders obviously and uh uh and there you were instructed so when you watch these shows, did what what was going through your mind? Were there several streams? Did you hear, um, for instance, do you have implants that that, that give them a telepathic uh, connection in through your eyes and ears? No, I have a, a portal that links me twenty four seven, so I don't have electronic uh, or etheric implants. I have a portal. A portal? Could you yeah. explain that? Um, yeah, it's uh, a. How can I explain it in, in 3D? I can't explain it in 3D All terms. All right, okay. So, in, in, well, I can, yeah. I can try, and, try and explain it. Um, it's an open connection that runs a two-way channel between the third dimension and, in this case, the fourth dimension, which allows me to have uh, communications at all times, which cannot be hacked or intercepted, um, and allows assistance to be brought to me if I need it. Okay. And then we'll just very quickly talk about the the instructions yes um what would happen is i would sit and watch a, a, a program i wasn't allowed to eat i wasn't allowed to talk there was no talking i had to sit and watch it but at the end of the program there would be a five minute question and answer session with my mother uh, where i could clarify anything that i'd seen and i didn't understand and she would answer so for instance in stingray one of the character puppets is called marina and she doesn't speak and um, the world accepts her as a mermaid, so she's this mermaid character. And I asked my uh, mother, uh, you know, why why doesn't Marina speak? And what I was told was, oh well, Marina is a cross between a human and a reptilian. So that's so you know. Oh wow! People okay. were being told this was a mermaid, but what my mother said was basically she didn't use the word genetic engineering or gene splicing but what she said was oh well marina is a cross between a human and a reptilian and hasn't yet sort of learned to speak so i was being guided um more more guided than instructed and it was what i made of it um so it was a very interesting upbringing i must say well i mean it <laughs> it sounds like anything but boring you know where you i mean i had to fight to watch star trek you know, I had to tooth and nail. Oh, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> like, oh, I hate those things. You know, I, I knew I had to watch them. I knew I, I you know, and even now, uh, mm. I realize the, the content. There's, there's encoding. I don't know where, I don't know what it is, but there, it tells you every, t every show has a tiny piece of the puzzle I've always found. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, even if it's Doctor Who or 
I mean, yes. there was that lovely Doctor Who a few months, a few years ago, when uh, they were tunneling deep down and they found themselves in a, a chamber. They, you know, dug the deepest mine that humans have <laughs> ever dug, and guess what? They bust into is a massive sleeping reptilian dormitory, and they, they're very unhappy with the humans. Very unhappy. <laughs> so, um, and and I think at the same time there was some other reptilian base thing going on. Um, so, let's let let's uh, segue our our conversation therefore into. Um, you've you've said publicly that uh, you are a, a hybridized um, hollow earth human um, uh, reptilian, and now is that a Draco reptilian or is that yeah. some other kind of reptilian? And um, and uh, your mantid side, <laughs> your mantid side is is like. Um, a, do they are they the, these the Kuiper Belt mantids, the same the same ones? And where do they originate from? Uh, can you fill us in on on some of the some of the crazier details of this or yeah, crazy details? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, hopefully it's not too crazy to you. Hopefully you and your listeners have done enough research and know enough to to perhaps. Not look on look on it as crazy. Oh I, no, I, no, no, we don't have a negative view of it at all. It's uh, it's I very very interesting. The, yeah. the Kuiper Belt uh, that doesn't play any part in it. There is a um, there are some people who are talking about spaceships <clears throat> hiding in the Kuiper Belt. I have no knowledge of that. Um, yeah, I'm one third uh, Draconis, one third Hollow Earth human. This is my soul we're talking about, not my physical body, and then one third mantid. Um, my energy signature, that's the higher self, uh, is predominantly reptilian. Um, so when you look at a, a living creature, uh, you would look at the soul of that person, that's the real person, but also that what we call the higher self, where the ten strands of etheric DNA uh, reside, and the energy of that um, when combined with the energy of the soul, will make up that person. It will, you know, dictate that person's character and their physical attributes. So my energy is predominantly reptilian, but my controlling element is predominantly mantis. Controlling element? Yes. Um, how would, would you characterize that as personality? Well, no, because a third, a th I'm one third human, one third mantis one-third reptilian um, basically what happens is the human third and the mantis third gang up against the reptilian third and outvote it on uh, most occasions uh, the, the mantis part is the thinking uh, the logical side the uh, collector the um, the recorder the human side is when I want to see a, a beautiful rainbow then I will connect with that human part um, if I need um, energy or something like that, then I will connect with the reptilian part. So it's about not so much uh, character, but accessing those elements that contain that energy that make you as a person. And once a person understands, you know, who they are, what they are, what their soul is, then they can connect their organic brain with their soul. Then they can, um, you know, really develop and and be something special because all humans have the capability to be special regardless of what their soul is. They just need to believe in themselves and they need to connect. So, would you say that you're unique on this planet or are there others who have combinations of of different soul groups in the same body? Uh, I'd like to talk more about that. But yeah. I've met one other person with the three parts I've met five or six people with two parts uh, to the soul most people would have the one soul that's that's the normal that's the standard um, because then you have to ask well, why why do you not have one soul is that source God that's dictated that or has some higher um, technological intervention come along and um, grafted something onto the soul uh, so in most cases people would have one soul um, but but I'm not unique by any means no 
Right. So, I mean, if somebody did a reading on you and they read your soul, would they be reading the mantid, the reptilian, or the human? Well, hopefully they'd read all three. Right. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, um, and, and in terms of who I'm speaking to now, yep. you can, you, plural, <laughs> can answer as one, uh, or do, do you have different characters that come out at different, uh, for different questions? No, because that would be someone who's, who's had mind control and then they would have alternate personalities. I don't have alternate personalities. What I have is one soul, which is equally divided into three parts. Um, if I'm debating in, in council chamber, then the mantid part will very much be the one to the fore because that's the one that's got to, um, you know, play politics and, and argue and be logical. Uh, if I'm with a, a, a club going out looking for, I think Americans call it rock hounding, uh, we call it fossil collecting, then, you know, that might be another aspect. So it's, it's not in the sense of three separate parts that, you know, play different, um, tunes if you like it's one one theme but within that theme there are flavors that's probably the best way to describe it okay that's cool that's cool um i do this system uh, you probably you might have been aware of it it's called, called the seven rays um and it's a way of uh um characterizing the different frequencies of soul note and things like that um, okay. So it's very interesting to read you because, like, I'm getting wow, what's this? What's going on? So I'm uh, the whatever you call. Well, uh, do you are you familiar with the term monad? No, I'm not. All right. Well, uh, the highest higher self, um, the source thing, um, uh, is uh, is on the the first ray. The your soul, the major soul aspect ray is ray five, which is quite interesting. That's that's a very kind of um, uh, cataloging kind of historian -y kind of uh, uh, energy and then then you have a ray 3 personality which enables you to talk to anybody um, and stuff like that uh, very communicative so uh, so it's interesting to, to, to look for the other rays which um, which would show up I believe if, if we if we're talking the same language as, as sub rays in your soul so, I'll, 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 as I listen to you, I'll, 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 I'll I use the dowsing to um, to it's determine fine. these. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll fill you in later. So, um, okay. So we have a question first of all from uh, Walt Silver, um, and uh, the question is is relevant to this point. So um, he's asking, what is your life purpose having this DNA mix at this time? Um, and I think you kind of touched on that a little bit just then when you're talking about the councils um that's a really really good question and it's funny you know uh, you must draw some very very um knowledgeable audience because i find generally with radio shows it's towards the end that the very good questions come in and then you know we run out of time so i think that's very auspicious that we've started with what is a very important question oh, yes. um uh, we are pivotal in the development of earth humans at the moment this is this is the end game and i don't mean the end game from a negative point of view i mean in terms of a new beginning um, and anybody who's alive on the planet now is is really blessed because this is a fantastic time i know it's going to be difficult but it's a fantastic time to be here to see to see this through and to see the great changes that we need to come through for the benefit of of every good person on the planet um, and i'm just playing my part a small part as many, many people are across the globe uh, who are doing everything they can to wake up humanity, get the message out there, be supportive, be helpful. Um, I, my soul, I'm trying to make the distinction for your audience, not my physical body, my soul was here very early on in the development of humanity and it's absolutely appropriate that my soul is here as the circle is joined up. So the beginning and the end for the new beginning. If that 
That does. Um, so you were here at the beginning, and one thing that you you mentioned before, I think it was you that mentioned it, but it was about about what the mantids are at, where where they're at is. Um, they look after the planet itself, not the human race, but the planet itself. Is that, is, is, uh, uh, so and what, what would be, what, what, what would be the point of entry? I mean, um, when you're talking about you, you, you were here at the beginning. Do you want to talk, to talk a little bit about that? That's I think, fantastic. I think originally, I think originally that the mantis were here for the planet because this is a beautiful water world. There are very, very few water worlds in any of the verses within the multiverse. Um, but over time, the mantids realized that the human race was something a little bit special. And so their allegiance moved to include the, the planet. Um, unlike the reptilians who have never moved really much from their position. Uh, in terms of the beginning, um, humans have been around for a very, very long time. But the physical bodies that we all have on the planet now, or most of us have on the planet now, are constructs uh, from a period of time when um, predominantly a reptilian race uh, acted to reduce the capability of the human creatures that were here then. And this is why we only have two physical strands of DNA. Um, and I, my soul inhabited a body of the first viable human. And that is why um, the reptile that comes to visit me occasionally insists that I call it Daddy. When I was a kid, it was Daddy. Now I just call him Dad. And the mantis or mantid that visits me, I now refer to as Mum. So they look on me as the first child that was created in this cycle. So I'm here now at this period of time, because the Earth is coming round, it's moving, human race is developing, and the human race must evolve. So I was in at the beginning, and I will be here for the next phase. Wow. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I hope you're not triggered by um, uh, sharp noises because um, my mixing desk has done it twice tonight. I hope it, well, yeah. um, just in, interesting enough, I met a, a doctor who had worked at Pine Gap in Australia. Oh, right. And um, her job was to uh, counsel all the guys who were having nervous breakdowns in the, in the military base. And um, she said something very interesting to me. She said to me, in my professional uh, estimation, she said to me, you have been programmed so that you can never be programmed. And uh, when I look back on my life, I think that's exactly what's happened. So I was put into a program which would mean that nobody could ever program me. And this was a safeguard uh, that I've been given. So no noises, trigger words, the number of people who either intentionally or unintentionally attempt to trigger me with their stupid little uh, Illuminati trigger words, and I always speak to them and say, oh, yeah, there's another trigger word there, you know. Um, no, I'm fortunately, I'm very lucky like that. Oh, good, because I'm completely inept at what I do, and I make <laughs> mistakes all the time, and, and like stuff like that just <laughs> oh, happens, do and I don't mean it, you know, so <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> all right, so... I um, have a sense of humour as well, so that's good. Isn't that's it? good. That's very good. So, hang on a second. All right. So, now this is a subject that's really close to my heart. How do the reptilians and the mantids get on with the jokey human? Because it's, well, it's the human side is jokey, isn't it? Do you mean the human generally, or are you referring to me? Yeah, within you, you know, it's like... <laughs> no, I don't joke. I only joke when I'm talking to people. Really? Yeah, because they don't appreciate humour, so there's no point in having humour. Because ah. they don't use it, they don't understand it, they've gone beyond that. When I think they've lost something, in fact, the mantis realise that they've gone down that road too far and that's why they're seeking to, to regain some of their uh, compassion in that sense of the word. So no, um, for instance, when, when, when I'm communicating with them, I don't use my mouth, so it's all telepathic. So as soon as you do that, your whole style of communication changes. So I can communicate in pictures and in colour, I uh, very rarely use words. Sometimes when I have to say a person's name, I'll form it in my head, but it's generally through pictures and colour 
so it's much faster and you don't have humour because you're too busy passing uh, information at very fast speed um, between yourself and someone else and you don't really have time for humour because it doesn't play any important part which is a shame I suppose because humour in the human sense is, is nice to be able to laugh so no I, I, I have two different styles of communication one with my verbalising with people on the planet and one when I'm you know being telepathic does that mean that it, um, it's kind of sometimes a bit of an effort to speak? Because, you know, if you could just idly think something and then toss the thought over, um, that's a lot easier than opening your mouth, breathing in and doing all that stuff, isn't it? <laughs> the, difference, the difference is in the quality of the communication. Um, when dealing with advanced races... Um, they're not really interested in what you did today, i.e. did you go to the, the dollar store and buy this? That's of no interest whatsoever. Um, but when talking to a person, they might be quite interested what you bought at the dollar store. So it's, it's about the quality of it. It's about the whole um, social aspect of it. Um, so no, you just, I just learned to develop because I, I had these creatures around me from a very, very early age. I learned to live in two worlds literally to be in two places and so to be appropriate in each individual world with with the type of creatures that i met and i just grew up with it wow so uh, you you've um okay so right so <laughs> so many so many questions it's all coming in from the, the um let, let's see if we you know so first of all you said uh, something about full circles or, or um, you came in at this cycle um, yeah. and is that because uh, you contain like a kind of blueprint that um, that you know like we, after the photocopy and the multiple photocopies it you know doesn't go doesn't look very much like the original blueprint is that like to kind of reinforce the pattern of hum human um, uh, consciousness in in a in a body or, or something like that is it, um, am I getting anywhere near or am I just babbling? Well, you're not babbling, but you're not near. Um... <laughs> All right. So so what's what's the what's the purpose um, of of you incarnating at this time? Right. Um, I contain one third of a reptilian soul, but it's not just any reptilian soul. Um, it's a reptile that makes decisions and these creatures are, are incredibly proud and they cannot face the fact that they may have made an error or that they are doing things that are wrong but they were sufficiently impressed to put as not just in me but to put a part of a ruling soul into a human body and let that play out so that my feelings, emotions, decisions could then feed back to them and they could then see if uh, a change in course was possible and that's really difficult to explain here. Um, for instance, if you believe that you are, have the God-given right to rule a people but you in the back of your head think well this isn't possibly right is there an alternative here and you think well i can't go onto the planet as the king because you know it's not going to work but what i'll do is i'll put an element of my soul into an appropriate body down there on earth and then let's watch that play out and interact and it will have some influence on me <coughs> And the whole key here is that the human race is on the verge of uh, changing and any good intentioned uh, creatures, and I mean it, good intentioned creatures, have the ability, there's going to be the most huge release of energy when human consciousness expands and creatures that are stuck in the fourth dimension uh, who are connected to the earth, <coughs> excuse me, who are who have become good intentioned can use that energy to try and pull themselves out of the um, blockage that they're in. Now the mantids or mantis have long understood that and uh, wish to change. The reptilians are hedging their beds. So my, my 
part of what's going on here with me is this process of working out just how viable it would be and whether the reptilians can actually change or whether they, they're just incapable of change. So that's one element of what, what I'm about. So it's quite, um, I mean, there's, there's, what can I say? I mean, it, it's like uh, there's a lot at stake, uh, yes. particularly for the reptilian. Yes. Um, because it's, it, this is one of these evolve or die things, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not just about the earth because it's that old adage of you throw a rock into a pool and mm. the ripples go out. Um, if, if races can evolve successfully on the earth, then that will emanate out through the multiverse and will have beneficial effect to other planets because this isn't the only planet that's going through this cycle. All planets go through this cycle. It's just our turn now. And if we can have a positive output, then that will actually emanate out and will assist across the universe. So what plays out on the planet Earth actually plays out right across the whole universe. Mm. So, and therefore what plays out in our individual lives plays out in the universe as well? Yes. Okay. Right. So, uh, so uh, right here we go. Um, more questions from Walt. I mean, we got um, Walt is uh, he's uh, he builds um, organite devices and uh, metatronic devices and uh, does shamanism and things like that. So he's okay. he's really quite there. And he so he's asking uh, because he comes across in his journeys he comes across mantids and and reptilians and and other okay. people. Um, is the mantid evolution affected by the evolution of human consciousness? Yes. And I think that's exactly what you just said, isn't it? Is that, uh, well, we, the human consciousness is being affected by the planetary consciousness. Is that, is that really like the right order of things? Is it like the planet's evolving and we're just piggybacking on it? And then our consciousness ripples out because that's what we do. I'm just right. guessing here. No, you're not. You're, you're, no, you're not. You're doing much more than guessing. You, you are. You are in essence correct. But the, the element that you've just not picked up on, or at least if you have, you haven't mentioned it, is that the human form is a striving to get back to what being human is really about. I mean, really human with twelve strands of DNA. Unfortunately, the new age uses the word ascension. Now, I use that sometimes because that's unfortunately what the audience understand. But we're not actually ascending. What we're doing is drawing down the 10 strands of DNA that were taken from the human body. And through the metagene, we are wrapping those up. And then uh, through a special code lock, we're undoing that code lock so that we are um, full circle. We're coming back to what we originally were. So it's, it's about regaining the DNA, which will then give us the consciousness link with the dimensions and the universe. So we should be telepathic. We should be able to do all the other things. But the earth is changing and it's one and the same thing. There's no such thing as coincidence. The, the earth is changing at this time and its energies through, through from, from, from center of the galaxy, if you want, have activated the human consciousness, but could only activate the human consciousness when the humans, the earth humans themselves decided that it was time for them to move on. So I have spoken about this critical mass of two or three million people, which we needed prior to the 21st of December 2012, because if we hadn't got the critical mass, the earth could have quite happily said, look, you know what, you guys, um, you've been along for the ride for on, on my planet, on my back for a very long time. Unfortunately, you haven't stepped up to the plate. Not enough of you have shown the commitment. So I'm just going to ditch you. Well, that didn't happen because enough people, um, you know, connected and made that spiritual jump. And as a result of that, it's proven that far more people can also make it through. So human consciousness itself is actually expanded and developed. And it is one and the same with the Earth because our frequencies are linked. We are inseparable from the planet Earth. Uh, there was a time many, many thousands of years ago when humans were far more spiritual 
Yeah, they didn't have motor cars and they didn't have computers and they lived in mud huts. But my goodness me, didn't they half love the earth and love the animals on the earth and calculate the stars and didn't pollute and communed with the earth and the earth has never forgotten that so we do have a covenant with the earth something that the reptiles don't have actually but the mantids do so we have one of the star cards up our sleeve is the fact that we and the earth are associated which means that we draw strength from the earth and um you know hopefully we can start when when we make the change we can start to put something back into the earth i'm sorry i was a bit bit long-winded there no, no, that's fine, uh, because, you know, you're going into a bit of the the kind of reason that the whole thing, you know, why are we all here? What are we, you know, like, the, the, the question, who, what, where, when, why? You know, why are we all here now? <clears throat> who who are we here with? And so um, that ties in with the... Not, I, I keep asking Walt's questions. I've got more questions to ask, but... Like Walt keep, keeps asking me, so we're, we're drilling down into this bit, but we, you know we've got we've got time. Um, how many species are represented in the t- complete human DNA code? All the twelve strands. Does that? I mean, when you say a twelve strand body, does that mean a, a body that that if it's inhabited by, uh, let's say, let's say a body that was if it was inhabited by a mantid soul it would look more mantid? Is, yeah. is it that sort of thing? Does it is it like a, the Doctor Who's chameleon circuit, or is it? Um, what what did twelve strands mean? You know, and and how does that pan out? Does that mean that that it's a really tightly grouped um, DNA molecule, or or is it different? I don't know because I, like, I just see a squiddly long ladder thing. Okay, I'm talking about twelve dimensions, <clears throat> not necessarily twelve different alien or humanoid races. Um, The reptilians would like people to think that they created humanity full stop. (coughs) Excuse me. And they've always wished Earth humans to look on them as their gods. Um, That's not the case. Uh, The mantis are are very clear on that. I don't know if, if your audience is familiar, but my, my understanding of the creation of humanity on this planet was about 500 million years ago, which in geological terms would be called the Cambrian period. There was a, a crashed spacecraft which contained very humanoid looking creatures who were from the 12th dimension. And it's this 12th dimension which equates to 12 strands of DNA. Um, and people should be in no doubt, that's why on a clock face, it runs from 1 to 12. That's why months of the year run to 12. And in Britain, until very recently, we had what we call the uh, imperial measurement with our inches from 1 to 12. So the number 12 has always been very important. Um, and so I'm not talking about 12 different races of people that came to visit humans and tinkered about with the genetics. Therefore, we have 12 strands. I'm talking about 12 dimensions and each dna strand equals to a dimension and that's why when you fly an alien spacecraft you cannot fly an alien spacecraft as you do star trek because if you think about star trek they sit at the console and they press buttons well i can honestly tell you that if you're traveling at three to four times the speed of light and you wish to turn left at neptune you can't press seven or eight buttons because by the time you've pressed the third button you're about a trillion billion miles past neptune you fly spacecraft with the dna the dna is the only thing that travels faster than light so the dna is is a secret that the earth military understand and that's why there was such a big run to do cloning here 25 30 years ago Um, dna is the secret all this um change that human consciousness needs is about connecting with our dna so connecting with the dna is the so uh, all right so i, I think I'm, I'm getting a kind of clearer picture because I've, I've always heard this thing oh 12 strands of dna i was like how can you fit 12 strands but if you're saying that they're hyperdimensional that they go up yes. in octaves Absolutely. Um, and uh you know because my understanding of dimensions is frequency 
Yes. Um, and it's just octaves. You know, you know, so, we, we see light in one octave and we go, it just keeps going up. There are still rainbows in higher octaves. You just can't see them. And yes. um, that's one of my that's my, my things. Will I be able to see infrared and ultraviolet? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you know, is it going to be cool stuff like that? Or is it, am I just going to see ghosts? The answer and, is yes. Yeah. Oh, how cool. Absolutely, yes. How very nice. Um, and, okay, so, now, uh, like, the, the the audience that we have here, we're we're pretty up to speed with most things, you know. Um, we, we try to get the, the best of understandings here. Um and uh so you know we're well up to speed on the reptilians the kazarians the the uh you know who's behind it all the jesuits the vatican and all it, all this business right yeah. um which and you know we do also understand that it's not governments or, or you know it's corporations and um yeah. you know so so again we're up to speed on the whole uh, uh way the world is um and one of the things we we chatted about just before the show uh was about to start um was what's what's happening in the world now i saw today that hsbc hang on let's just say uh that let's see if i get the right jingle um there we go the hsbc A aka Barclays Bank, aka the evil ones, have pulled out of gold in London, which is like really important thing. Yeah, it's like saying I've just pulled the plug out, um, and the dam is just going to start trickling away from there. Is is that is that the kind of um, state of play, Simon? Yes. Um, back end of last year, fall, autumn of last year, I was predicting. A uh, very large economic crash, but not in America. Every pundit was talking about America crashing, and I was the only one saying, nope, it's going to be Europe. Um, and to a certain extent, I've been vindicated because um, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the International Monetary Fund put 50 billion uh, euros into European banks and have promised to put further 50 billion in every month. This, of course, is not real money. This is just noughts on a computer screen. But they obviously saw what I'd seen, that a European collapse was imminent. Um, my best information is that they may just have saved the day from their perspective. Um, if we're going to see an, an economic collapse in Europe, it will be around September, October, November of this year, but if the IMF, the two things here, if the IMF continue to put in 50 billion every month, and the three key money men that matter in Europe, one's in Frankfurt, one's in Bonn, and the other one's in London, if at least two of them continue to believe that these fake zeros mm -hmm. will mean they can make a profit, then there'll be no collapse. Now, separate to this, there's the game being played about pulling the plug on the gold standard. I don't call it the gold standard, but um, the, the world is going to divide into two, two camps, those with gold and those that do not have gold. Um, and America and Britain do not have gold. Switzerland got most of its gold back, not all of it, but most of it. The Chinese have a fair bit. Germans have a little bit. Um, but by pulling its trust in gold in Britain, what they're actually saying is, we know that Britain doesn't have any gold, therefore we wish to disassociate ourselves. So it's the beginning of the move which I predicted about a year and a half ago, where we'll see two camps, those with gold and those that don't. And of course those who obey the golden rule, which is those who have the gold make the rules, um, it will determine who's 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 got the boot and who's in who's um well i mean here's the thing what happens next simon because this is supposed to be some transition into something good this doesn't sound at all good it sound, sounds like uh uh we'll all be plunged into some kind of poverty well you know if you're making a pizza you may start off with a a big lump of cheese and then you have to grate the cheese 
during the grating process that's very painful it doesn't look good but when the cheese is nicely put on the pizza it looks really good so we have to go through a process of difficulty to come out the other end and that is basically what will happen we'll have some problems but the end result is good okay so um this is what i mean <laughs> all right um not much of a not much of us are bible bashers but um uh we we have half an eye on half an eye and half an ear on the book of revelation it's like hmm yes war and rumor of war yeah we've had that um and all these other things um and uh the the you know uh, poverty and and starvation and all these things uh but the the main thing it, of of that is the thing that they call tribulation um that it, it feels like yeah it sounds like we're being graded definitely hmm. so um we've got I've, I've got more questions and they, they're more about like other other things if that's all right or whatever just whatever okay it's so it's nice to involve it's nice to involve your listeners excellent excellent okay so this is a uh, wolf baby um, where do the hollow earth humans originate? Oh, really good question. They didn't originate in the hollow earth. They were originally from a, another star system that came to this planet, um, integrated with the indigenous population, but were always separate. Uh, when the uh, fall of man started to occur, they were moved out by the mantid race as a sort of a, a library or as a, a reserve stock in case human humanity became so corrupted or destroyed that it wasn't viable anymore. Um, there was a time to come back and repopulate the earth, but it was like a seed bank, basically, and it was considered quite useful to maintain this small, very small, but very vibrant group. Um, and that's really where it comes from. Okay, and so um, this is where your human soul third comes from. Correct. And I was, was going to say riding, you know, like Yorkshire's divided into three ridings. Yes, yeah. yeah. You, you, um, you human riding. Um, that uh, there's uh, that it's it's hollow earth. So it, it's basically. Hang on, <clears throat> this is a soul from all, not. Um, but do you get, are you getting, do you, oh, yeah. My, see, my big question, Simon, and maybe you can answer it because, you know, <laughs> is like, how does the soul hook into the body? And um, why do some people um, uh, leave it and come back and, and uh, things like that? What's the, is there a, because like the greys are supposed to be able to transplant souls and stuff like that. How come, you know, what, wh what is it? <laughs> why, why are we stuck and some people aren't, you know? Um, several, okay. Several, several questions. But, several questions. Let's see if yeah. I can, my poor dyslexic monkey. But let, let's start, That's let's good. start with how does the DNA hook into the body? Uh, well, the DNA is separate. No, no, sorry, sorry, the, the soul. Yeah. Oh, sorry, what I mean is, how does the soul... The soul choose, in most cases, the soul will choose. If, if a physical body dies, the soul has to leave that body. If there's a viable body nearby, it will automatically go to that body, but only if it's a viable body. Um, here's where the manipulation occurs, either from source itself or from uh, technologically advanced uh, off-worlders. Uh, a body can be genetically altered so that it is more pleasing to a soul. Um, let's say, for instance, a Palladian soul incarnated into a body that was heavily uh, reptilian in its energies. They would not get on. The body would attempt to eject the soul. The physical body would become sick. So in most cases, uh, the energy overlay of a body it matches or is at least reasonably compatible with the soul. So a soul will either through source choose to incarnate in a body or it will be directed by technological means. Well, I can't remember what the other questions were. Well, it's the, um, the first one is, yeah, the, is what is the hook? What is the thing that, uh, because not every soul can hook into any body. 
No, but but it's not about. Uh, well, I, don't, I don't understand what you mean by the word hook. Um, a soul, a soul has to have a physical body. Even a twelfth frequency creature who has a light body, they still have some form of body because a soul needs to have a framework around it. So a soul will look for a body that's appropriate for it, and and it will be drawn. If you had the choice, it would be drawn to a body that most closely matches uh, the body that it's used to being in and has the same frequency resonation as the soul so that could be your hook i suppose yeah okay so it's a it's a frequency um a frequency match which would be the ray yeah that's what it's over yeah okay um i can i can (laughs) can, all right i'm getting that okay so um more questions from wolf baby uh no no first of all um, from Starlight 4127, first of all, Wolf Baby 127, this is Starlight 4127. Um, Jay, that's God, they're, they're going off, <laughs> they're going off the air. Oh, hi, Leprechaun. Um, to say, yeah, big shout out to everybody in the chat room. It's a great, great evening here. Um, but, uh, it's jumping up, this thing is jumping up there. All right, before it moved. Um, could you ask about reptilian spirit guides? All right, this is from Starlight 4127. Could you ask him about reptilian spirit guides? Because I was told I had a reptilian-like spirit guides when Walt did a journey for me. Thank you. This is this good or bad, Long? <laughs> is this good or bad having reptilians um, wow. in your in your spirit guide uh, repertoire? Okay, it's not what you are; it's what you choose to be. And um, there's too much BS on the internet. Um, you know, reptilian is bad. Palladian is good. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, There are good reptilians, to use a very banal, plain human term. Um, You can certainly have reptilian spirit guides, which are good and not so good. And the way to judge it is how supportive are they towards you? Is the advice they're giving you beneficial to you? So judge by the actions of your spirit guide. You know, if they are uh, loving towards you and they are giving you what seems like good advice then they're there for a good reason. If they're always attempting to make you feel unhappy or um, questioning yourself on a negative way, then maybe they're not so good. So there are certainly reptilians out there who uh, take an interest in individual humans and wish to assist them. So when you're talking about, I mean, is it that one day we'll become somebody's spirit guide? Um, no, unless you choose to be. Uh, remember that a spirit guide is actually a living soul. It's a soul that's able to send its consciousness from one frequency into another. If you have a DNA link or a uh, parcel life link with somebody and you saw something go wrong and you don't wish that person to make that same mistake, or you swear allegiance to that person that you will protect them or you will care for them, then you will be able to send your consciousness through time and space to attempt to nudge them towards a more positive outcome. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, Okay, so more questions. Here's one more from WolfBaby127. Which is, again, back back to the beginning. Back to... Uh, the the craft and she's asking where did that craft originate from the 12th dimension in terms of races and in terms of which star system if we can relate to i mean 12th dimension what does that mean to us in terms of our galaxy or you know you know can we picture 12th dimension can we picture dimensions okay i don't think that the akashic records actually have the answer we're talking 500 million years ago. We're talking about a, a group of very humanoid creatures who were 12th dimension. The craft developed a fault. Every alien spacecraft that I've ever come across has a nuclear reactor as a power plant <clears throat> in some shape or another, although it's a different sort of nuclear reactor than the ones we have on Earth. The craft crash-landed. It had somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 living creatures aboard. The craft had to change from being a 12th dimension form into a third dimension form because it was on the Earth. This took two days. Now, that was equal to about 6,000 years in our time. 
when the doors opened after what had been two days for the, the occupants, but about five or six thousand years for those living outside, of the whatever thousands were, were came out, only three to four hundred survived the shock. Um, I've never been diving, but I've talked to people who have dived really deep and then come up too quickly and they get what they call the bends when they get like bubbles in their blood. Well, it, it was sort of like that, but, but many, many times worse. So we had maybe three or four hundred of these creatures who had been in the twelfth dimension and were forced down into the third dimension. And then their technology just dissipated and they became incredibly spiritual, but they ended up de-evolving. Uh, de-evolving into sort of like ape-like creatures, although with intelligence and verbal communication. When the reptilian arrived, what they were interested in was the, the 12 strands of DNA, because the 12 strands of DNA still existed with these creatures, but they had gone down a spiritual path and not a technological path, and therefore they didn't associate the reptilians as dangerous or evil because they didn't know that. So the reptilians basically tricked them, uh, removed 10 strands of DNA, but the universal law says you can't disempower somebody by taking the strands away and then trashing them. So they stuck them in an energy overlay. So when we talk about our higher selves, what we're actually talking about is our auric field with the 10 um, energy strands of DNA. And ever since that time, the human body has been attempting to reconnect with the strands. And this is the metagene. The reptiles never got the metagene. They never got the code. Uh, and they, frankly, must never be allowed to get it. So that, that's a sort of reported history. Wow. Now, that, that was brilliant. Now, um, we're going to take a break. But uh, I have to ask this question right now. Alex Collier. Have you heard of Alex Collier? Yes, I have. Um, he referred to a group called the Pertal. Is this the same group that you're talking about? It is an offshoot. It's an offshoot. Right. So, but yes, they are related. Right. Very reptilian. Okay. Uh, and I've also heard a story. I heard a story. It came out on the Project Camelot website. Okay. Uh, but it was a woman who remembered that scene of the whole... She was on that spaceship. She was one of the inhabitants of the spaceship. And she said uh, she was, like, Indian. She came... She, she was somewhere in, in the east of the, east of the, of the world. Um, and um, she was... Uh, she was recounting almost that, that verbatim story that you were talking about. I'll have to go and find that. That would be very interesting. I'll, for... see, I'll see what I can do. Uh, if, but I, I'm sure it's on... Um, on Carrie's site. Okay, uh, thank you. She, she, I mean, she's got such a library. And so has Wolf Spirit, I have to say. Um, so, <laughs> um, let me just... Uh, all right, here's... Uh, I'm, actually, I'm really enjoying this. This is a, a tune that I made that I wrote the other day um, uh, to uh, as, as something to imitate another piece of music that we didn't have the copyright for. So, I've... <laughs> I, I made my own version of it, which has taken on, on its own life, and I quite like it. Uh, it's quite sweet. So uh, I hope you, everybody's listening on headphones. It's quite nice on headphones. Um, but uh, I'm going to play a couple of our new, um, our new promos and things like that, uh, which we've just been, we just created them. Uh, and yeah, let's let's put um, Walt's. Uh, this is this is Walt Silver's uh, uh, commercial, so I'm going to play that for him anyway. Okay. Shamanic Journey by Walt Silver. Feel like you are guided by spirits or angels or guides? Want to know who they are and what special message they may have for you? Have Walt Silver take a shamanic journey to contact these magical beings. Perhaps they have a tool to help you in the form of an energy device specifically made for you. Go to CosmicReality.net and click on the Walt Silver button. Walt Silver, a member of the Wolf Pack.
Ray Readings by JP. Want to take control of your life? Start with the basics. Learn what prominent energies are at play in your soul and your personality. Go to everbeyondradio.com and get a Ray Reading from JP. Discover how to capitalize on your strengths and mitigate your weaknesses. Claim dominion one ray at a time. Everbeyondradio.com A member of the Wolf Pack. Beyond your Beyond, beyond, beyond. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to Ever Beyond. And uh, tonight's guest, Simon Parks. Well, yeah, it's getting really exciting now. So we go all the way back to the beginning of, of stuff and people crash landed. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have to find that uh, interview. It was several years ago. Um, I don't know if anybody in the chat room is aware of that, uh, of that particular interview. So uh, I'll have a... Uh, um, I'll have a look uh, in, a, in a while. Yeah, if I if I come across it, Simon, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, send it to you by email or or something like that. Okay. So yeah, um, so there's the cycle there, and so um, and when the reptilians got here, they started working on this um, this rather. And the, uh, do you, would you call that? Is that the fall? Is that what people call the fall? Yes. Right. And this is five hundred million years ago. No. No. Five hundred million years ago is when the twelfth frequency humans first landed on Earth. The fall would have been um, probably around two hundred and twenty to two hundred and thirty thousand years ago. All oh, right. So this is a completely different thing. All right. Do you, want to, do, you, do you want to tell us what's the real story behind the fall? Because we see, you know, we see, uh, you know, um, a dumbed down story with apple, apples and snakes and stuff. Yeah. What's the deal, Simon? Tell it. Because, I mean, you're, you're, you're speaking from a standpoint of being able to uh, remember from your own point of view or from being able to read the Akashic Records, which is almost like the same. No, I'm remembering personally. Um, literally, the fall of man, as the church would refer to it, although they put a completely different spin on it because their religion, uh, was the removing of ten strands of DNA, and meaning that you couldn't be telepathic, you couldn't have a connection with the earth in the same way, you couldn't move objects around, you couldn't heal somebody who had cancer. Um, so that's the fall of man, was the loss of abilities which were natural to us. Simple as that. But the religion, the church has changed that to say, oh, you know, you've upset God, so you've uh, sinned. So here we go with the wonderful word of sin, and, um, you know, that's, that's a different, different take on it. Right, so what you're saying is that uh, we really have been victimised, and... Um that uh, sin is not our fault it's, some, it's something we were thrown into and it's not something that we should be we should blame ourselves for is that right or, or I mean or is there some other higher responsibility that these 12, 12 dimensional people didn't fall here by accident it was all you know etc you know? yeah I think you've answered your own question I think the, the important part here is maybe we had to go through this to actually understand what we had. Um, you know, I, I, I moved to my location some 20 years ago and I now live by the sea. And for me, it's a very beautiful place um, and I really value it. But someone who's born here perhaps doesn't necessarily value it in the same way because they've had it every day of their lives. So maybe in some ways, if you had 12 strands of DNA and you had the capability to do almost anything, Maybe you didn't realize just um, how lucky you were, how gifted you were. Maybe it would became impossible to work through problems. If you are in a higher dimension, then problems do not weigh on you in the same way because you have the capabilities to overcome those problems. That's why so many higher frequency entities incarnate into human bodies in the third dimension because a problem really is a problem here. We don't have 
telepathy, um, we can't heal, and everything is physical. So we have to really work hard at overcoming our problems. So that's why so many individuals who have karma from many lifetimes choose to incarnate here to try and get it all sewn up and overcome it. So um, I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in chance. I do believe in God. And I think that um, that the human race had to go through this process to come out the other end to be really strong. I see. Uh, so, I mean, that... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a kind of if it doesn't kill you it makes you stronger kind of philosophy about things really yeah. um yeah but i don't want people to think that we sort of said come on stick a knife and slap us around the face that's what we want <laughs> yeah come on <laughs> Not, bring it on <laughs> what happened was that we were tricked so let's get that straight yeah uh, gesler tell us the story please tell us the story and also the people who not all of them but many of the people who run the world um, are playing by rules that we never expected them to play by. Because when you are coming from a position of decency, you naturally expect everyone else to play by those rules. Well, that isn't the case, or it hasn't happened. So we've been unfairly hoodwinked, unfairly tricked, and this is why we sank deeper down, because we were having to contend with people who did not play the same rules that we did. That's why it's taking us longer to climb out of the pit. And that is always the problem, isn't it? It's like, it's, you know, <laughs> it's a pit. I mean, the walls are slippery and it's muddy and we're trying to get up the sides and every time, you know, yeah. and you have to, yeah, exactly. So the, the metaphor is, is still holding. Um, right, right, okay, here's... <laughs> <laughs> more questions uh, uh, as, as you said as you said um, yeah, we, we, we do have uh, everybody's kind of up to speed is Simon familiar this is from Wolf Baby once again is Simon familiar with the idea that mantoids originated as a more bee-like species from Venus with a hive mind that was more connected to love and at some point got infiltrated by greys and Pleiadians and hijacked to Mars uh, no, I'm not aware of that. The, the mantid species is older than the grey. I'm talking about the original grey species. The mantid is definitely older. It's one of the most oldest and most learned species that you can get in the fourth dimension. Um, uh, no, I'm not familiar with that story at all. Sounds, sounds very interesting. Good, good. So, um, oh, hello everybody, hello everyone. Um, this is, uh, it's lovely, we've got a, a great, uh, lively um, audience, right, so what's, uh, oh, can we, so, yeah, um, back to the whole, um, right, so, yes, what you said before um, about ascension, what people talk about ascension in, in, uh, in the parlance uh, I use is initiation, which is basically a kind of connection. Yeah, um, sounds good. Um, and it's to do with the way that through harmlessness your chakras clear out and uh, you become connected and you lose the difference between your higher self and lower self you know you, you, yeah, good exactly right yeah uh, so um, so do, do you want to talk about how that <clears throat> we may experience well I, I certainly feel that this is something that has been coming on slowly for many many years starting with one thing and then starting and then going to another and another um, and it's it always seems to be they lead you they teach you one thing and you get that and then once you got that they teach you another thing and then you get that and then it's piece by piece um, and this seems to be the same thing with what people call the ascension process or the, the initiation process which is uh from what i can understand is the the developing of a continuity of consciousness between the different states of being like when you're awake and when you're dreaming and when you're thinking and when you're feeling and all of these things um am i am i along the right lines here or, or, or does that agree with what, what your uh, the, understanding is? You, you, you use different words to me, but 
what you are saying is exactly the same outcome. That's exactly right. Um, you know, there, there's a difference between somebody who has done the, the spiritual research uh, and someone that hasn't. And if you uh, unfortunately get hooked into the wrong sort of sites on the internet, then you can have a very different idea of ascension uh, than somebody who, you know, has been more fortunate to be able to find sites that are more accurate. So we have a wide range of the population who have different understandings of what ascension actually means. Um, and, you know, it's become labelled as the New Age. And I actually don't have a problem with the New Age because I think it is, in its essence it's teaching the right things. Unfortunately, just as in the, the flower power movement, the elites have deliberately infiltrated um, to sow seeds of discord and to lead people on the wrong path. And it is a minefield out there to actually find, well, who the heck sounds right to you and what information sounds right to you. And ultimately, you know, I'm sure you would echo with me that we'd say to people, just trust your higher self, trust yourself. Uh, just ask yourself, is what you're reading, does it sound true to you? Um, and judge people by their actions because it's so easy to come out with all these wonderful words and, you know, you know these people that um, talk about um, spiritualism and loving thy neighbour and doing the good things and then they get into a $350,000 motor car <laughs> and they, they, they live the life of uh, living in mansions and yet they say to people, you know, well, you know, you should live like this. So their actions don't follow through their words. So always check if you find an individual or you find a, a website check it through to see if it sounds right to you uh, it's so important that people don't get taken off we're nearly there now and every every person is a fantastic wonderful creation and every individual i want everyone to to make it through i want everyone to have that opportunity to choose whether they want to step through or not as the case may be and uh, i really get rather um, annoyed when you know people who are liars or deceivers attempt to split the the, the 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 consciousness of humanity i'm just going to let my cat in because the cat's scratching at the door do so indeed uh, because um I, that's another thing that i'd like to hear you talk about simon is um is the uh, so uh, what i'll just cover the time when while you go I'm and get back. the cat that's okay right. it's just it's just just come on down yeah yeah I'm in now. okay so you got a really interesting story about the cat okay do you remember that one well, which one? It so. was one that um, that uh, I think Mummy taught you about the cat and the snake. Ah, well, I assume it was Mum um, because the creature that appeared to me was in disguise, <clears throat> but I think it was. Um, yes, it was part of a a learning visit uh, to explain that there was a fair bit of reptilian in me and there was a fair bit of reptilian around me, uh, <clears throat> and then um, conveyed a message from the reptilians for me, which related to my domestic cats, and that lesson was then given, and then the lesson went on to other, other things. But yes, I was shown the similarities. Um, it's funny, you know, when you, you talk to people, and everybody accepts without question generally, and why does a mammal, because a domestic cat is a mammal, why does it have an eye like a snake? And, you know, if you ask people it, and it's as if they've never even thought about it. You know, why would a domestic mammal have an eye like a snake? And when you ask the vet, the veterinary surgeon, their automatic response is, oh, well, it helps them to hunt in the dark. Well, no, cats don't hunt in the dark. They're corporeal, which means they hunt in dawn and dusk. An owl... An owl hunts at night, total in darkness, but it uses its ears to hunt because it hears the mice moving. And if you look at an owl's eyes, they're like ours. So, you know, for me, it's, it was very clear evidence that genetic manipulation has occurred not just in humans, but in a number of other animals, <clears throat> which makes perfect sense because if you were going to operate on a human, wouldn't you like to practice on some of the lesser life forms first to get, your, get it right? And that's exactly what happened. They experimented on other creatures. And once they'd worked out what they wanted, they then went and 
started moving the test tubes about to change humans. And was that done? Uh, my my feeling is that a lot of that done was done with um, the use of sounds, or the use of uh, sound to uh, manipulate the DNA. Is that correct, or, or am I? Or did they have micro telescopes and you know uh, electron manipulation? Or no, you're you're absolutely right because you, when you're building a spacecraft, you use uh, a combination of laser beams and sounds to build a spacecraft molecule by molecule. Um, and if we think about the ancient, ancient, <laughs> the Old Testament, when they walked around the walls of Jericho and used their trumpets to bring the walls down, and how many of us have had the privilege of listening and watching a wonderful singer shatter a glass with her voice? Um, and so each strand of DNA has its own frequency, and if you can activate that frequency, you can use it like a magnet, and you can actually lift it, move it, and change it. Um, change it without actually altering the encoded information on it. But then you can then change that vibration to alter that enco encoding and to join them together. So when manipulating molecules that will make a physical substance like a spacecraft, they'll use sound and laser beams to build it. But when altering um, uh, DNA, they'll use devices that are focused through, through sound, which is just another form of energy. The reptilians are probably the most eminent um, geneticists anywhere in the universe. They are absolutely phenomenal. So whatever we may think of them, um, then you know somebody who's reasonable would have to accept the fact that these creatures are absolutely gifted uh, at, at uh, genetics. They're not very good at creating. They can't do what humans do. Humans, and, and you did it with your, um, you didn't want to make a sound break the copyright. So you used thought, and with your thought, you created reality out of thought. The reptilians are absolutely useless at doing that. What they do is they steal ideas off other people. They replicate what's already there because they are not very good um, at creating from thought. Uh, the humans can do that. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably the best way I can answer that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Not only that, but the uh, I use a piece of software to create the music. And that <laughs> I love the way you said that because it's called reason. Huh. So <laughs> it's just like <laughs> thought exactly, reason, logic, and uh, all these things. It's a, a very wonderful program, and it allows me to use four three two. It allows me to tune the uh, the whole thing uh, automatically, so they will just get recorded straight in there. Um, ah, wow. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, oh yes, yes. Now, Andy NKO. I wonder what NKO, NKO means. Maybe it means new something, Kentucky. I don't know. Who knows? But Andy is saying, at what point? <clears throat> at what point? At what point does Simon feel that disclosure will be forced upon the governments, if it will be? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be along with his claws there. Um. It will be forced. Um, they've already had an ultimatum, and the ultimatum is uh, you disclose, because then you as a government can control that disclosure and you can manage the situation from it. But if you don't disclose, we will um, do that, and you have lost the control over the management of how that information is released and how your populations will respond to that. Uh, there have been twice now where that's been put back because the Earth governments have pleaded, well, some of the Earth governments have pleaded that they didn't have enough time. That now is, there is no more time. There is no more uh, dispensation. So we've got about 18 months before they really have to make a decision. Okay, so here's another thing. This is my own, my own question here. And this is, this is to do with everybody's favourite aliens. Okay. Mork, Simon, uh, Robin Williams, yeah, and Spock, both with the K thing. All right. Um, is that part of a deliberate plan to kind of kill off the the fictional version in order to bring in the real version, the real extraterrestrials, and the real uh, secret space program? 
uh, I read it as more to do with getting away from blobs and bug-eyed monsters and try to get fixed in people's heads that aliens could look very human. Um, this was the point that, I mean, you know, I'm, I've always been quite clear that there are very, very real aliens amongst us now and have been for many, many years and put, uh, put a hat on them, put a suit on them or what have you, and they can get by. Not all of them, but some of them can get by. And so I think what Hollywood was under instruction as part of a um, slow disclosure program uh, was to educate humanity that most aliens actually don't look bug-eyed with 20 arms and goodness knows what, they actually look quite human. So it was a um, an adult attempt uh, to get people to buy into a character. That's what Babylon 5 and all the rest of it is about, to like a soap opera, so you can actually get to understand and get to feel part of these different alien cultures and understand what they are and who they are, even if they're fictitious, um, you buy into it. And that was the whole part of it, to get people ready to accept the fact that um, these alien creatures did look like us. Because um, when Orson Welles did his um, War of the Worlds radio show, just before the Second World War, he was under instructions to do so, and that was at a test to find out how the public would respond um, to to a, an alien, not an alien invasion as such, but the realization of aliens were were real and amongst us. Yeah, it didn't do, didn't go too well, did it? No, because the problem was that the other arm of the elite manipulated the press, and the press lied and said there has been mass panic. There was panic in some places, there definitely was, but but some arms of the press actually played that out of all proportion. And so into folk history went this thing that all of America absolutely shut down. And so military, have, some elements of military have consistently used this as a, well, we can't tell the people because the people aren't ready for it. Now, what's interesting is that last week or the week before, um, John Podesta, uh, Obama's, one of Obama's closest aides resigned. Uh, he was actually an aide to, uh, I think, President Clinton as well. And uh, in his resignation speech, Podesta said that one of his greatest sadnesses was that he didn't get the alien disclosure out. He's actually said on it, he actually tweeted, hashtag, um, uh, the truth is out there. Now, why would a top aide to a president as part of his goodbye speech, actually say, I was a bit sorry that we didn't get all the truth out about disclosure. So, you know, people are trying to let ordinary people know that there's something very big on the horizon and that they can't sit on this for much longer. So I am hopeful in the next 18 months to two years we have a real chance of disclosure coming out. So that brings me to the, the concept which is what I think has been part of the dark side agenda in the constant denial and truth embargo is that when the truth comes out, it comes out as a shock. Yeah. And that again traumatizes humanity. Uh, and that this has been a constant battle between the light side and the dark side. Yeah. The light side are, are making movies like Star Trek where, you know, we are friendly with aliens. Um, and the dark side of making, um, you know, Independence Day yes. and, uh, you know, disaster movies and, and stuff like that. Um, so it is really hard to pick through the predictive programming. We've, we've, um, we've been very fortunate to have uh, Stuart Swerdlow, who was part of the Montauk Project, um, had a, uh, he, he's sort of educated us about, you know, what predictive programming does. And, and, uh, how they also inject anyway long story so um let's have a look we got more questions we got more questions coming in from the chat room it's brilliant here um okay so um here's from uh, from nancy um does simon believe in a creator consciousness existing referred to a mother earth or gaia yeah so before i answer that I mean, i've shared a um stage with uh, Stuart, Stuart Swerdlow, and uh, I got to meet him a couple of years back. Um, he's a very genuine man. Um, everything that he, he says is true. Um, 
certainly in relation to Montauk and some of the aliens he's seen. It, it, we spent a couple of hours talking and, um, you know, it was very clear to me that what he was coming out with, you do not find in books, you don't find on the internet. You only know if you associate with that particular alien race or that, that human elite. Uh, and Stuart and I got on very well because, we, you know, when you meet someone who's genuine in all ways, then, um, you know, it's very obvious. In terms of the question now, um, yes, the Earth has a fantastic consciousness. I uh, do believe in that. This is a feminine side, actually. Um, and there is a... The, the aliens actually don't call God God. They refer to God as the undying creator. And I suppose I take comfort from the fact that these superbly advanced alien technologies are no closer to understanding God than we are. And that's, I think, the way it's meant to be. Although they accept it full stop in the sense that they're not trying to understand it because they've reached a level of understanding where they know that they'll never understand it. So, yep, they refer to God as the undying creator, the one source that the major one source that can create life and has a consciousness and a will and that every planet has that consciousness and everything that lives also to a certain extent <coughs> excuse me has an energy consciousness as, as well uh, and that's what the you know today many people look on primitive peoples and they're very rude about these people but these so-called primitive peoples actually understood and knew about the earth and the life on the earth much better than most people do today. So they were only primitive in the sense that they didn't have motor cars and they didn't have computers, but certainly spiritually they were advanced. That does seem to be the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the rule of thumb, you know, it's like, yeah, and here I am surrounded by computers, so what does that tell me? Okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, so we've got more. Um, Again, from Andy, from NKO, wherever that is, or whatever. Tell me what NKO, what is that thing? Anyway, percentage-wise, roughly speaking, what proportion of the Earth's population have non-human souls? Now, that's a very interesting question, because I, I, I want to talk about soul rays and things in a minute. Does, does your questioner mean Earth-human? Well, yeah. There's see. What what do you mean by hu by human, non-human? Yeah. Um, do, do you want to? Do, uh, I'll, there's I'll there's so many I'll, so many I'll, aspects I'll, to it. Go ahead. The, the questioner means Earth human souls, um, as opposed to human. Because remember, if you're from the fourth dimension and you're a Palladian, you are human, but you're not an Earth human. But I think the question. I'm assuming the question means Earth human. Um, the reptilians have a very big say in the makeup of uh, the human population, as can be gathered from what I was saying earlier. Uh, I would say 75% of the planet are made up of Earth human souls. The rest are anything that's not indigenous to the planet Earth. So they're about 25% alien. Well, yes. or not non-terrestrial, whatever yes. that might mean as well. Because, like, you know, uh, how long do you have to be here to be an Earth human? Is it like being Scottish? That's a, very, no, that's a really, really interesting question. I'm, you know, because like, I live in Scotland, right? And everybody says, oh, yeah, Scottish. No, no. <laughs> you know, they, they wouldn't say I was. You know, my neighbours wouldn't say I was Scottish. They say, oh, damn it. Oh, yeah. That's enough. Oh, yeah. You know, um, and, uh, you know, nobody in London would say I was English either. But anyway, so how how do you determine what's, what's you, what, what, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. yeah. It's when the soul chooses to incarnate in a human body out of choice, not because it has no other choice. In other words, um, when a the body that it's in dies, the soul actively seeks a similar makeup of body. The problem is that with many earth humans who are not awakened, they are, you know, for want of a better word, sleepwalking. And over a period of time, the soul begins to lose connection, not with, with, with source, because it can never lose that, but it begins to lose connection with the human body it's in. It's not communicating, and therefore it becomes, from again, want of a better word, dumbed down. It begins to accept what the organic body 
is telling it. Whereas if you have come from another universe or another dimension or another place, you are continually fighting against injustice. You are continually challenging and saying, this isn't right, you shouldn't be doing this, uh, or I don't understand this, these, these people are crazy. And you know, it's, it, So many people say, I don't fit in here. And that's because the soul is not earthbound and it's sort of saying, well, this is all mad. Whereas those people who have a nine to five job and, you know, good luck to them and they're very happy with it, but they, they believe everything they're told and they don't question and, um, you know, that's their world. And they'll come in and put the TV on and they'll believe everything they see and they'll think, yes, absolutely. Well, that's an earth human soul. Now, it doesn't mean that that person can't change, but that person's got to want to change has got to actually say, hang on a minute, there's something wrong here. So it's harder for them. It's much easier if you come from the Pleiades because you're already 50% there by wanting to question and, um, you know, you just instinctively know that things aren't right. But if you've incarnated and incarnated and incarnated to such an extent on the planet that this is all you've ever known, then it's a real hard job to get these people to wake up. And that's, that's where the battle is going to lie in the next two years. Right. Okay. So, um, let's let's just stick with the soul thing, right? So, uh, I was saying before, you have, you do. I, I I measured two sub rays in your soul ray, and one of them is ray one, um, which I presume is your um, king daddy um, uh, writing, and then uh, you have a ray two, which would be your um, earth human so perhaps your ray five is is uh is manted that would be uh it's a uh, do they have a very concrete consciousness the manted can you define what you mean by concrete consciousness um in terms of uh hmm not very abstract Yes, you're correct. Right. Okay. So that that would be much more of a fifth ray, and, and you say they like to collect things. They certainly do. Right. So that's yeah. That again, again, that's a ray five thing. Um, everybody knows um, uh, Dave, who uh, uh, who I started the station with. He died last year, but uh, um, he had a ray five personality, and he would collect everything. Anybody, any video that anybody would post, he would upload to his uh to the wolf spirit radio site okay. um and so you know anybody that anything that anybody t spoke about on the on the show was available to all the things and that that's the sort of thing and you know i've got a streak of that myself so <laughs> that's a, that so that that's the, so that's very interesting so meanwhile did a little hang on i've got one of these meanwhile <laughs> oh it doesn't work where did it go uh i have to have that press there we go meanwhile yeah, I love these things. Um, all right, okay, yes, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good question. Oh, yes. Um, what planets have Earth humans visited by means of black engineered alien technology? Um, and do you know anything about what this black engineered technology is made of? And you were saying, you know, you, you build it molecule by molecule with a, uh, an ion beam or something? I didn't use the word ion. No, I was I, I put the eye on the anyway. Okay. Um, yes. Well humans have visited other planets and have done for a very long time. Um, there's been an embargo around the Earth which has just recently been lifted and up until then only authorized uh, missions could be let out. Um you know, we don't want to stray too much because we go on to about the, the fake moon landings, etc., etc. But certainly, uh, since the late fifties, uh, humans have had the capability of leaving the Earth and visiting elsewhere. Um, this has been by two things: one by gifts of technology, and then separately to that back engineering technology. The gifts of technology that the humans have been given are not particularly helpful. Humans have gained more from back engineering craft. Um, the Roswell crash, that's two spacecraft that crashed, not one. Uh, that was certainly back engineered to make many things. 
Um, at the moment, the Americans are holding first-generation triangle craft. They're a bit old-fashioned now, but they have first-generation, which they would use if they ever went down the false flag alien invasion route. It would be the first-generation black triangles they would pull out for the for the cameras. Um, so yeah, um, the humans the humans are fantastic. I mean, they are uh, yeah brilliant creatures. I mean, they can really really create. The problem is they've outstripped their spirituality. They have technology now which um, is about 50 to 55 years ahead of what the public on the street think they have. And the result of that has meant that they um, can begin to uh, look on themselves as perhaps a little bit arrogantly. And some of these, these people in the military really do, or government, think of themselves in a very arrogant way because they have such technology now that it's completely outstripped their ability to control it. So, yeah, um, since the late 50s, certainly been capable of visiting other planets. Yeah, the, uh, the TR... I think we are, what, are we up to TR7s yet? <laughs> I'm not sure what the number of, what the number is on the triangle craft, mm. but there's certainly grey stroke human stroke reptilian lineage. All right. So here's another question from Nancy. All right. Um, does Simon believe there is a sentient consciousness in all life, including mineral, animal, and plant? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Do you have a hilo zoistic philosophy? Well, I did actually answer sort of I didn't answer it, but I sort of touched on it about 17 minutes ago when I basically was saying um, that life on a planet had consciousness um, so trees do, rocks do but it's how we measure that consciousness for instance it was 15 years ago that an American research team actually worked out that a particular tree somewhere in South Africa I think it was or South America and when it was threatened could send out some form of vibration which could be picked up by another tree maybe 10, 15 miles away through the root system. Now, you know, forgive me, but to me that's a form of consciousness because that's a form of co communication or warning system. So yes, I genuinely believe that most things have some form of consciousness, although as we, you go down the life form scale, that form of consciousness changes. So I agree with her. Uh, you see, it also is that we project our consciousness into something. For instance, a, a lovingly played violin or guitar yes. um, takes on the consciousness of the players. Yes. So uh, a, a sensitive musician will pick up the guitar and, and it will play itself. I've experienced that personally many times. Um, people talk to crystals. Um so yeah i you know i'm I'm totally because if the universe is alive then everything's alive and everything's like a cell of something and even if it appears to be like yeah it's all about scale as well you know if you well, zoom that, zoomed right out things yeah. things look different don't they well that that's that i forget his name now i'm not very good with people's names but that famous japanese chap that you know got ice crystals uh um, dr emoto thank you and um you know there's your evidence full stop Yep, yep. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we we're cramming it. We're, we're cramming them in. These are these are like one shot. Right. Are our human souls being prevented to, from returning yes. to our true yes. source energy when we die? Yes. Do you want to talk about the light and that thing? Um, all souls generally wish to return to source. Uh, if they can't go to source, then they'll go to what they consider to be home. That's a natural thing for everybody. Um, this is a prison planet in the true sense of the word. There is an energy grid, and I've, on my conferences I've shown some of these elite patches worn by black ops, United States military. And on many of them you see the emblem of the Earth surrounded by a black grid like a fisherman's net. That's nothing to do with the natural energy that goes through the Earth. This is to do with an energy overlay which means that any soul attempting to leave the Earth to go and rejoin its source is captured, um, stunned, given amnesia, and then returned and just goes back into another body. Now, the reason for that is that if, you, if they didn't do that, uh, imagine somebody, I won't say Einstein, because he perhaps wasn't as clever as many people think, 
But if we could think of a really um, clever or spiritual person, and they lived to about 80 and they died, and then they came back, let's say, and they remembered everything they did in the past life, well, they wouldn't have to start off at the same experiment. They would say, okay, well, I'll pick, off, pick up from where I left off. Well, within three incarnations, this, this, this human race would have evolved fantastically. And so the people who don't want that to happen ensure that each time we incarnate, we don't remember what happened. However, it's not foolproof. And that's why sometimes we find three, four, five-year-old children who somehow magically can play a beautiful Mozart concerto on a piano with no music. And what's happening there is that that soul in that child is remembering from a past life when it played music. Or you have a, a young kid who's a chess master at the age of five. Well, it's just not possible on a 3D planet. What's happening is the soul is remembering. And just as many people have past life snippets or bits of memory that play out, some people are very fortunate and they have connection to a whole load of memory or, or some form of DNA um, coding. So we have evidence that it doesn't always work, that people can get past live memories back, they can connect with who or what they have been, but generally speaking, uh, most people don't, and so therefore it's another form of enslavement. So people are not developing. The, the negative forces wish to keep the status quo. Yep, you can have a brand new iPhone, uh, it can do this, it can do that, but the game doesn't change. People think they're advancing, but they haven't been technologically. The advancing that is occurring over the last few years is a spiritual advancement. And that's where the real advancement is going to come, not in technology, but in spiritual ways. And I've always passionately believed that. Well, that's a good thing to passionately believe in, isn't it, Simon? Wow. Um, okay. More, more questions. Here's another one from Wolf Baby. What is the purpose of the pyramid-shaped mountains on Earth that are found on every continent? And we're just looking at um, Mount Kailash. has a very square attrib attribute. And uh, also, um, uh, my own personal favorite uh, uh, pyramid candidate is uh, Avebury, um, Silbury Hill in Avebury. I remember standing there in Wiltshire looking at it and thought, Damn me, that looks like a flat side. That looks like what would happen to a pyramid that was like 20,000 years old that was covered in grass. I don't know, mm. what do you think about that? Well, I, again, the answer the answers lies within the 3D world. I mean, back in the 19, late 50s and early 60s, um, I don't want to advertise, but the Gillette company, uh, who produced, I suppose, a, a safety razor, um, and you can't get them for love nor money now, but they produced a little metal pyramid um, which folded at hinges. And after you'd shaved, you, you placed your uh, razor blade in a north-south orientation and closed this pyramid up in metal and left it overnight. And in the morning, it was sharp. And that's not a joke. It actually ionized. The irons were focused through the three sides of the pyramid and actually affected the edge of the razor blade. Of course... What happened in um, the company was the shareholders suddenly realised that people weren't buying as many razor blades. And because these razor, razor blades were becoming self-sharpening, so they soon stopped that. So the pyramid shape um, has always been understood as being important. There was a, a, an oligarch in Russia, a very, very wealthy chap, who built six or seven um, small-scale pyramids in Russia. And an experiment was undertaken. Only the Russians could do this. And convicts from prison were actually brought out on a regular basis to spend time in one of these pyramids. And they actually found that uh, it was a very beneficial effect. The amount of reoffending went right down. So through all of human's history, the pyramid shape has had great significance, both through technology and through spiritualism. Um, and if you haven't got the technology to build something in stone, then you build it in earth. But the real key here is a physical pyramid, or a physical-like pyramid, but a, a true pyramid in energy sitting over the top of it. And in many places on the planet, you will find what looks like a rough pyramid shape. But there are only very few humans who can actually see the 
energy pyramid that just sits on the top. And this is, this is um, very much like what's, what's got to happen with humans. We have to draw down into us our strands of DNA. And so these energy pyramid shapes which sit over the physical pyramid have to come down inside the physical and become one. So there's a lot of change that's got to take place. Wow, Simon, that's great information there. That, uh, that very, very, very good. And, um, yeah, interesting. So you're talking about um, the, the, uh, the fact that every pyramid is an etheric pyramid and that it's an in, in, in the 3D is an embodiment of that thing, but this thing exists on other dimensions, and that's why, because it, it anchors all the way through. Is that correct? So that's great. Some right. some have been destroyed. Though. Some have been taken down and destroyed or, or um, mothballed. But mm. the vast majority are still there, yes. Mm. Yes. I just, I just got a flash of Stingray. And when you said Stingray, I instantly thought of Marina. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, the hybrid. So um, here's, uh, uh, again, from Andy. Why do we dream, and when we sleep, what is happening with our souls? I lucid dream often. Can I turn this into an astral projection? How to become more connected? So many questions. Many question. <laughs> right. Uh, dreaming is, is, is a really important aspect of being human, um, and is simply because we are disconnected from our higher self. When we dream, we are connecting through our higher self to another level of consciousness to another another dimension and we are recharging that is why if you don't if you go without sleep um the doctors tell you if you go without sleep it's a medical condition i don't buy that if you go without sleep you begin to hallucinate and that's because you're not able to play back or connect with source because you the human without the 12 strands of dna connected cannot connect with source in its waking life that's a very important point. A 12th dimensional creature can connect with source in the day, in its waking state. It's connected all the time. Now, yes, humans are connected all the time with source, but they're not able to communicate. Now, when you go to sleep, uh, you are able to open to source and connect, give and receive. And that sort of reboots you for the next day. That's why humans are in the sleep pattern. Um, but when fingers crossed, everything goes to plan, um, we wouldn't actually need to sleep very much because we wouldn't need to do what we have to do at the moment. Sleeping is a product because we have been robbed of our DNA. Well, 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 well. That's also very, very interesting. The, the, and the angle that that question came in and the answer that came in, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. All right, so here's, here's a question about you personally. What does Simon think he will go to oh what does simon think he will go and do after this incarnation i have actually thought about that um i think i think what will happen is that i'll have a along with many other people have a well-deserved holiday and then i'll get bored and then someone will come along and say look there's this planet on the wherever um needs a bit of help are you up for it and um They'll probably be bored and, and get involved in it. I can't leave this planet until it's been the cycle is completed. So um, half of me loves this place, and half of me wants to be away. Um, you know, and, and I've had conversations with off-world creatures where I've just said I'm hardly sick of it because there's pollution, pain, filth, murder, rape lies, greed, and it just doesn't happen on many other planets. There's no other planet like this. However, you know, those people who know they came here to do a job, and I always say to people, don't, don't chuck it in, don't walk away, because then those that are left have to carry your workload. And the more people that say, I've had enough of this, then, you know, what happens there? That work's got to be picked up. So everybody who's here for a reason, whatever it is, you've got to stick at it, see it through, because we all agreed to come here. Um, and then once the job's done, then let's have a damn good party. 
It's just, it's just, you know, knowing when the party is. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, more questions. Um, is Gobleki Tepe, which is a place I can never pronounce the name of, the site of the Garden of Eden? Um, I can't tell you. Um, I don't know the name of it. I suppose if I went there, I could be fairly certain. Mm, yeah. All I know is that it's what we would call, in the biblical sense, Mesopotamia. All right. It's near near the main river, but um, I, I can't. I can't. I just don't know. I can't say. I'm afraid. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, also, this is from Shake Up NWO. Shake Up the New World. What do you know about organ technology? Um, not a huge amount. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that um, has felt that I need to, to be brought up to speed with or discussed with. Um, there is so much. There's so much to this to, to to the world that we have. There's so much to the aspect of it. Um, my I tend to be brought up to speed with things when. There may be something that's, I don't know, in, in uh, research that's been there 25, 30 years, and then suddenly some scientist somewhere finds an application for it, ostensibly for good, and then some very nasty person comes along and says, I tell you what, we can use this for a military purpose or a war purpose. Yeah. And then I will have a, one of my regular visits, and then someone will say to me, um, you need to be aware of this. Uh, so that hasn't come up on my radar screen yet. Interesting. Simon Parks, uh, I do hope you've enjoyed it enough to come back because Have we could... Have run out of time already? We, we've, we've burned two hours, man. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. What a, what a, what a ride. Um, uh, yeah, if you, well, listen, um, I'd love to see you come up this summer if we, if we can arrange an actual, uh, um, gig for you and, uh, we can certainly... Do you like Indian if, food? If, if you arrange something, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come up and, and do a workshop or yeah. something with pleasure. Do you like curry? Um, as long as it's got no garlic in it, because garlic is a neuron inhibitor, I'm happy with that. No garlic. I'll, I'll tell him. Um, <laughs> who's saying that he's the, the manager of the local Indian restaurant. He's also a great fan of uh, Sam Os Osmanagic. Um, okay. He's been out to the uh, Bosnian Pyramid and is into the... Oh, fantastic. So he's a, he's a great guy. So, um, you anyway... You got yourself a deal there. <laughs> it's great, yeah. So <laughs> we'll, sort, we'll sort you some non-garlic food. Bless your heart. Say... Um, so I was going to say, say say hi to Mummy and Daddy. Um, ble uh, uh, Simon Parks, thank you very much. This has been Ever Beyond. Stay tuned for Frank Jordan and the Earthmind Think Tank Group. This has been Ever Beyond.